So we want to open up in God's Word now to Matthew chapter 5, and we will look at the first two Beatitudes. I know that some of you have thought that this has been taking so long to actually get into the Beatitudes, but the idea with that is to be able to, to slow down a little bit as we hear Christ's first words in his first sermon, in this first gospel, to open up the uh, New Testament, and then that we'd be able to slow down again as we get to Christ's climactic work at the cross. And so just a heads up for you, these are the two places where we're going to slow down, the Sermon on the Mount at the beginning, and then again at the work of the cross toward the end. I can't think of two better places to slow down than in those spots, uh, beginning Christ's teaching ministry and earthly ministry, and then concluding his earthly ministry with his redemptive work. So we've been in Matthew 5, 1, 2, and 3 for a while, haven't we? We looked at the, the king's first sermon by way of understanding the context around it for a week, and then we looked at the king's first word, blessed, for two weeks, both in the immediate context and in the whole biblical context. You could see that we tried to summarize it in this way. Now look, I'm just going to say right out of the gate, nobody can summarize what the biblical theology of blessing in the Bible means in five simple points. Nobody can. So we attempted the impossible. Some of you have pointed out some other passages that are significant. You'd be right to do that. There are more significant passages than this, the ones we're referencing here. And so totally get it. We, we gave it an attempt to say that uh, being blessed means from Genesis to Revelation, living a fruit-bearing, multiplying, filling the earth life as a steward of God's created gifts. Now, that begins only physical. That's going to become more and more spiritual as you move into the life of the church, specifically in point number four. That fruit-bearing, multiplying, filling the earth life, actually, as you come into the, the story of Abraham, and then deeper into the Old Testament and into the New Testament, is discovered to only be acquired through faith in Jesus Christ. That has to be centered on the cross work of Jesus Christ. Rejoicing in the blessings of Christ, which are every spiritual blessing. So the, the blessings that are most fundamental are the ones that overthrow the curse of sin. Those are the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. And then trusting in his word. So it seems fair to understand, we'll leave some things out, that blessing in the Bible incorporates the whole sweep of the Bible from the very beginning when God first creates the man and the woman, to the very end as God is closing down the book of Revelation. That's what it means in summation to be blessed. In other words, to be blessed is shorthand for what it means to really live. John eleven twenty five 25, and 26. So if this is what the blessed life looks like up on the screen across the street of the scripture, then what does it look like as Jesus defines it, lived out? Well, that's the Beatitudes. And that's where we're at this morning. So let's start into these Beatitudes in verse 2. Jesus opened his mouth and taught them. And that opened his mouth word is, it, phrase is not throwaway. It occurs two other times in the New Testament. One time when Philip the evangelist opens his mouth and brings a gospel to the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. And the other time when Peter opens his mouth and gives the gospel to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10 to Cornelius. So here is now Jesus opening his mouth and giving the gospel to the Jews. Philip will open his mouth and give it to the Samaritans, and then Peter will open his mouth and give it to the Gentiles. Do you see the flow? Those are the only three times that that phrase is mentioned. It's not a throwaway phrase. And when he opens his mouth, he teaches them saying, and this is our text for this morning, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So we're going to see that the poor and the mournful are the blessed ones just from our passage today. There's more to say than that. Obviously, there's more beatitudes than this. But we're going to pause here and consider these beatitudes in particular. And I know that you've already memorized them, right? Are you seeing my facial expression back in the back? You probably can't. I'm staring you down in the back. You are to also in the back say, mm-hmm, yep, we're memorizing them. Aren't you in the back? Yes? Okay. The front people are so close to see, I can see them. 
The back people, I can't. Back people. You with me? Okay. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. There are some cultures that I've traveled to, by the way, where like, response is very natural. In the second service at North Creek Church, it's not. <laughs> so thank you, oh, lonely soul in the back that responded. <laughs> Let's start with the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you want to tie the, the, the blessing in the front with the promise in the back, the poor are royalty. The poor are royalty. They are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. They're subjects of the king. The kingdom of heaven is shorthand for the kingdom of God. You could say it other places. The kingdom of heaven belongs to Christ. He's the king. So to be a subject of the king belongs to those who are poor in spirit. That's the blessing. Now listen, by way of explanation, we've said enough about the term blessed, but look at the second word, are. This is in the present tense, and so I don't, I'm not going to go word by word through this, okay? But the second word is are, and it means a present state of blessing for the poor in spirit. Blessedness has already begun in the life of the believer. It's not something we wait for. It's something we already have. Now, to be fair, there are beatitudes that have a promise that arrives in the future. Look at verse 4. For they shall be comforted. Verse 5. They shall inherit the earth. There are future orientations to certain promises, but this one's present. He will not only be blessed, the poor in spirit, but he is blessed. So who are these blessed people? Well, they're not who the world thinks are blessed. I guess later on tonight there's going to be these, is it the Oscars or is it the Grammys or is it the ESPYs or I don't even know what it is. I don't watch any of those. So I couldn't tell you the first thing from the second, except for I know that tonight they're giving out little golden statues. <laughs> <laughs> like, do you work your whole life to get a golden statue that's like this tall? Hey, you know, like, is that not the very model of futility? <laughs> I mean, the world says that the ones who are happy, the ones who are living the good life, are the ones who are the achievers, the driven, the educated, the wealthy, the popular, the gifted, the fit, the beautiful, those who are true to yourself, those who are free to be whoever you want to be. But what happens if um, you're beautiful and poor? What happens if you're fit but you're ugly? What happens if... Um, you're educated, but you're unemployed. I mean, is this some of the, the good life that you have all of this stuff or only one of these things? Does anybody really think that just because I'm driven, I'm living the good life no matter what else happens? Who exactly is living the good life? The one who's true to themselves? What does that even mean? I mean, it's not the point of every Disney movie the same. Be true to yourself. When you look in the mirror, and you look in the mirror again, who do you see? I see me. And you have like a little tear that comes down. That's every Disney movie ever made. <laughs> By the way, I was telling our seminary guys this week, praise the Lord for Disney, because it's a little window into our culture. It helps us see what everybody else is thinking. It's a mirror for our culture. I'm not saying you should go run out and watch them all but it is helpful by way of analysis. And here's Jesus' first sentence, and he's turning that whole self-centered worldview upside down. He's, he's showing us that deep, enduring joy comes not from being true to yourself. And if you're visiting for the first time here at North Creek Church, man, you need to know that you have a choice to make this morning. You can come in and kind of imbibe the world's worldview, which is in order to live the good life, the blessed life, you've got to be true to yourself first before you're true to anybody else. And I don't know if you've noticed that just in reading the first phrase of the first verse of this Bible passage this morning that Jesus is saying, that is dead wrong. It's just totally, 100% wrong. The 
path to joy, the road to blessing, comes not from being true to yourself, and it doesn't come from being at the top of the heap. It comes from being poor in spirit. Notice in the text that poverty leads, poverty leads the list. Notice at the end of the list in verse 10 that persecution finishes the list. Blessed are those, verse 10, who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is also the kingdom of heaven. Who belongs in the kingdom of heaven? The poor and the persecuted. Welcome to the kingdom. Doesn't sound much like the world's view of the good life, does it? Martin Luther said this, every true saint is an heir of the cross. There are many who love self-professing Christians. There's many self-professing Christians who, who love Christ's crown, but they want to wave off his cross. Those self-professing Christians are not disciples of Christ at all. So what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It's like when you go to a jewelry store and you, you're looking for a stone for your wife or maybe your girlfriend who you want to be your fiance or, you know, for yourself as a guy. Does anybody, I don't know, maybe you do that. So you go into your jewelry store and you, the, the guy puts a, a stone. He doesn't put it over against a, a light backdrop. He puts it over against a dark backdrop so you can see the, the glory of the, the different facets of the stone shining over against the, the clear differentiation of what the stone is not. So let's see that in the same way. What does, it mean, what does it not mean to be poor in spirit? Well, it does not mean, number one, to be materially poor, physically poor. Being physically poor doesn't mean you're poor in spirit. Jesus, notice, is not saying in the text, blessed in spirit are the poor. He's not saying that. Physical poverty is not to be equated with spiritual blessing in the Bible. In fact, poverty can be every bit as dangerous to your spiritual health as wealth. Turn to the book of Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. I want you to see this for yourself. This is at the end of the wisdom book of Proverbs. There's a series of wisdom sayings or discourses. And in the middle of Proverbs 30 is a prayer, actually. So it's a wisdom discourse that's shifting into prayer. It's unique in that way. And so it draws attention to this specific discourse. Proverbs 30 verse 7. Two things I ask of you, Lord. Deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying, number one, number two. And give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. That sounds like Christ when he says, give us this day our, what? Daily bread. We'll come back to this later in the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 9, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? So there's a danger clearly about being wealthy. It's true. Wealthy people tend to think that they're okay and they don't really need God. Okay, but then look at the opposite, verse 9. Lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. There's an equal danger for those who are poor physically. They can violate the commandment of God and so profane God's name. Which one's more dangerous? Both are. And that is wisdom. And so we cannot conclude that Jesus' meaning, that in this opening introduction to the sermon, that he's referring to, blessed are the materially poor. Neither does he mean, number two, spiritually poor. Now, let me explain spiritually poor, because it sounds just like what you just read poor in spirit. There are those who, who think that poor means ignorant. And, and that this means that those who are spiritually ignorant are not under a curse, but under a blessing. And they use verses like this to support their case. They've never heard the gospel. They're spiritually ignorant. And so they cannot be under a curse. They must be blessed. That reading of this beatitude is untrue on the surface. 
Because you must read the scripture in light of other scriptures to make sure that your interpretation of this verse is sound over against other passages. That's hermeneutics principle number one. And so then you come up against like Romans 1, verse 18. That says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. No one's ignorant of God. For his invisible attributes, namely, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, so no one has an excuse that they didn't know about God, that they were spiritually ignorant. Additionally, Romans chapter 2, verse 14 says that God has written on men's hearts his own law. So to be poor in spirit is not to be ignorant in spirit. Nobody's ignorant in spirit. In their heart of hearts, men know that they are violating God's law and stand under his judgment. So we deny that being poor in spirit means being spiritually ignorant. No man is ignorant of God. This also doesn't mean being poor in spirit. Religiously poor. Religiously poor, number three. There are some religions who, who embrace taking a vow of poverty. And not just Roman Catholicism, but other ones as well. That the path to mm, devotion to whatever God you want is through a vow of poverty. And they're thinking that in the Roman Catholic context, they're being obedient to this beatitude. And they're being obedient to, like, for example, Jesus' command to the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, verse 21, where Jesus says to the rich young ruler, if you want to be perfect, go sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come, then follow me. But we've already seen that Matthew 19 cannot mean that. It cannot mean simply that because Jesus tells the rich young ruler to give away all he has and then come follow him, that it must mean that for everybody, not just him. And in fact, that interpretation, that understanding of Matthew 19 is a misreading of the context and a misunderstanding of how Jesus is confronting that particular idolatrous man. Jesus will confront us in Matthew 19 through the young man. But it doesn't mean that every single person has to sell all they have. Just think about different people in the Bible. Did Abraham sell all that he had? Did Joseph sell all that he had? Did David sell all that he had? Did Solomon sell all that he had? Did Daniel sell all that he had? Did Isaiah sell all that he had? Do you see? It can't not mean that what the rich young ruler was being asked to do by Christ was what Christ is asking of every single one of us. He is, but not like that. And we'll get there in Matthew 19. A vow of poverty is not the path to blessing, nor will it earn you entrance into the kingdom of heaven. So what does it mean then? Well, let's talk about real quickly what it nearly means. <laughs> it's like we're getting closer, getting closer, getting closer. Okay, what does it nearly mean? Well, it nearly means mm, humility. It's clearly related to humility. And I think it's fair to say that though being poor in spirit is very closely related to pure uh, humility, I, I've been helped by the Puritan pastor Thomas Watson to see some of the distinction too. Thomas Watson wrote a book on the Beatitudes. It's kind of famous, and if you don't have a copy of it, you should pick it up. He says this about the relationship between poor in spirit and humility. Quote, there is some difference between the two. I think poverty of spirit is the cause of humility. For when a man sees his want of Christ and how he lives on the alms of grace, this will make him humble. Listen, humility, he says, is the sweet spice that grows from poverty of spirit. So poverty of spirit is the root of which humility is the fruit. 
Watson is saying that, that my total inability to commend myself to God in any way is how humility flourishes in my life. To be poor in spirit is necessary to be humble before God. The one is a precondition for the other. So related, yes. The same, not quite. Also related to poor in spirit is self-denial. There are many in our camp who would make a simple connection between being poor in spirit and denying yourself. Again, Thomas Watson's helpful here. He says that there is significant overlap, but the poor in spirit, in, well, overlap in this, the poor in spirit will deny himself and he will acknowledge his dependence upon Christ and his grace. But those two things differ in this. The self-denier parts with the world for Christ, but the poor in spirit parts with himself for Christ. So the self-denier parts with the world for Christ, but the poor in spirit parts with himself for Christ. There's one that's a precondition for the other. The poor in spirit sees himself to be nothing without Christ. The self-denier will leave himself nothing for Christ. Do you see the difference? There's overlap, but there's distinction. And one is a precondition for the other. Now, that means, therefore, that we should come to the application about what it actually means. And what it actually means is, if I could restate the, the beatitude, blessed are those who acknowledge that they are spiritually bankrupt before God. That they are spiritually bankrupt before God. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. Not just somewhat poor, totally bankrupt. Now, to be fair, poor in spirit doesn't appear anywhere in the Old Testament, not that phrase, but its nearest counterpart is probably Psalm 34, verse 18, that says this. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. The crushed in spirit. That's something near in the Old Testament to what Jesus is saying here in the New and then turn to Isaiah 61. Isaiah chapter 61. Where is Jesus probably referencing, going back to the Old Testament? Jesus hardly ever speaks without referencing the Old Testament. So where is he referencing the Old Testament with his beatitude? Probably Isaiah 61. Listen for the poor in spirit. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me, verse 1, because the Lord has anointed me. That's similar to the language of, of been made the Messiah. To bring the good news or to bring the gospel to who? Hmm. See, this is some of that response stuff that the second service needs to work on. First service is just, they got it. So what does it say there? To bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. And there, there's a poetic kind of coupling of those two things, the poor and the brokenhearted. You heard the same thing in Psalm 34, the brokenhearted and the crushed in spirit. So, so here again, we're seeing that coupling happening. But the word poor here in the Hebrew means to be afflicted in soul. So do you see, even in Isaiah's time, poor doesn't mean materially poor. It means afflicted in your soul. It means spiritually needy. The word brokenhearted, actually, the, the couple, the couplet, the word brokenhearted means to be shattered, to be smashed, to be broken, to be wrecked. So, so this is another kind of informing way to say what being poor in spirit means. What does it mean to be afflicted of soul? It means to be smashed, shattered, wrecked spiritually. And that's the kind of person to whom the good news is preached and received. That's the person for whom the blessing of God is reserved to bring Isaiah 61 together with Matthew 5. The good news binds up those who in their heart are shattered over their sin, starting with their own. In the end, being poor in spirit means acknowledging that we have nothing but our sin before a holy God. 
And the path to eternal blessing begins on this point, that we are not just poor, we are bankrupt, we are beggars, coming before the king of the universe without anything to get us in. It is a little bit like the person on the corner who's asking you for help. That's you. You have no gift to give to God, no relationship to lean on, no merit to claim, no hope of blessing. So that in the presence of the king of the universe, all you can do is beg. Like this. Lord, I have nothing. I bring nothing. I am nothing. The only thing I bring are these filthy rags of my sin. I am unrighteous before you and thus unclean to appear before you and thus undone before you. I cannot pay the debt I owe you in my sinfulness. I, because of my sin, deserve your judgment, deserve to die, and deserve to perish in hell. So have mercy on me, Lord Jesus. You're going to hear that phrase all through Matthew. Have mercy on me, Lord Jesus. Give me what is needed for entrance into your heavenly kingdom. By your grace and mercy, one at the cross, forgive my sin, pardon the debt I owe you, cleanse me from my iniquity, declare me righteous in your sight, and take me to be your very own. I have nothing, and I am nothing. Have mercy on me, Lord. You want to know the contrast? There's a man in Luke who walks into church. They call the temple. And he stands up in church. And he looks up to heaven to address God. And he says, thank you, God. Thank you. That I am not like other people around me. Extortioners unjust people, adulterers, even this tax collector. You see him, don't you, Lord? The person sitting next to me in church? I'm not like him. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of everything I have. I, 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 I. Look at me, God. Look what I do for you. Look what I have to give to you. That is the exact opposite. The nice, upstanding, morally defensible church person Who, who lives life thinking that people owe them something, and if you really peel their heart back, they think that God owes them something too in this church. And the person who's poor in spirit is the person standing right next to him. Oh, sorry, no, he's standing far away. And he's beating his breast, and he's saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And he says it, in the present tense, I am the sinner, God. Be merciful to me. Which one went down to his house? Which one left church justified? You know the answer. Not the hypocrite. If you've never known what it is like to really see and sense your desperate need for mercy, then you have never known the salvation of your God. It's as simple as that. God's salvation begins with making a man see how poor he is and then showing that man how rich Christ is to save. Upon the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ, your begging for mercy is met with his grace. Until you see that you are poor in spirit, smashed and shattered in your sin, you cannot get into the kingdom of heaven. And by the way, in Matthew 5, 
The word theirs, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, is shoved forward for emphasis to say this. Only these kinds of people will go to heaven. The hypocrite will not. And by the way, the hypocrite isn't the person not in church. They're not hypocrites. The hypocrite is in church. Blessed are those who acknowledge that they are spiritually bankrupt before a holy and a righteous God. I preached a sermon back on Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 in August of 2018. I think it was entitled something like, Without Christ, we're disobedient, something else, and doomed. You should go listen to that if you haven't, as just a further explanation of your condition if God will not show you mercy. The second beatitude builds on that last one. It's interesting. I mean, is this what you would think would be the path to blessing? Would you make this out to be the, plat- the path of the good life? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The mourners are comforted. The explanation is important here. What does it mean to mourn? What does it mean to mourn? There's a false mourning that we must be careful to avoid, and it's easy to fall into it. There's, a, there's the mourning, you could say, of Judas Iscariot. Was Judas Iscariot, was he mourning? Was he sad? Was he sad when he betrayed Jesus? Not initially, but was he sad afterwards? Yes or no? Yes. Did he mourn? Yes or no? Yes, he did. He did, which tells you that there's a mourning that's false. That gives you the idea that you are doing something that's being called for, but you're not. You're faking yourself out. The mourning of Judas Iscariot, who regretted betraying Jesus, is probably more mourning than some professing Christians have ever done in their life. There's such a spirit of like, you know, who who wants to be on Jesus' team? Just raise your hand and we'll pray for 30 seconds and boom, you've punched your ticket to eternal life. No, you haven't. Judas is in hell and he mourned for his sin. He confessed his sin, actually. He made restitution for his sin. He gave the money back. That blood money. Why wasn't he saved? He mourned. Why wasn't he blessed? Because his mourning was born out of an inborn desire to protect himself. Not to come to the end of himself. He mourned his sin against Christ And then he ran away from Christ. His was not a repentance that leads to life, Acts 11, 18. There is also the mourning of King Saul. King Saul. Did he mourn when he was confronted by Samuel the prophet in 1 Samuel chapter 15? Samuel, what is this bleeding of the sheep that I hear? Saul was sorry, wasn't he? Wasn't wasn't he mourning? He said this, 1 Samuel 15, 24, I have sinned. For I've transgressed the Lord's command. He said that to Samuel and pled for Samuel to to have him hear this confession. Yet his mourning over sin, was it false or true? Mourning. It was false. Revealed by this one phrase that he says from his mouth to Samuel. 
Samuel, come back with me and honor me before the elders. There's the window to the heart. Preserve my reputation. Preserve my power. Preserve my reign. Preserve my reputation. Samuel, come back with me and help me save face. I am sorry, but can you help me honor, be honored among the elders and save my bacon? He was mourning for the purpose of self-preservation, and that is a false mourning that is not blessed. It falls under a curse. You can read it for yourself in 1 Samuel 15. There is the false mourning, thirdly, of Cain, Genesis 4. Cain, confronted by God about his offering, his worship, it's false, is more troubled by the consequence of his sin than he's troubled by the sin itself when he says, my punishment is too great to bear. You see, there's a man who was more concerned about his consequences than he was about his sin. This is like, I feel like this is a massive part of parenting, by the way. I mean, is this not what parenting is about in discipline? Are you not looking for a window into the heart of your child? When you discipline them, are you not listening for something that gives you an a little indication of if they're broken over their sin or if they're broken because they got busted? Well, if that's what we're looking for as parents, is it not fair for God to be looking for the same in your life with your sin? When someone comes and confronts your secret sin, when someone walks up to you and, and, and finds out that you're looking at porn. What are you going to do in that moment? What's your morning going to be about? If you're looking at porn right now, you, you have this text to give you the ability to rehearse before you get confronted because you will get found out. So when you get found out, then what are you going to do? How are you going to mourn? Are you going to mourn like Saul? Are you going to mourn like Cain? Are you going to mourn like Judas? The word mourn is back in Matthew 5 associated with repentance. In this context in Matthew 5, it must refer to mourning over your sin because of the context tied to the previous beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. Gospel mourning occurs when you mourn more for your sin than you do for suffering for it. Gospel mourning occurs when we see our sin hindering our relationship with God, and so we grieve. Gospel mourning occurs when we mourn our sin that makes a mockery of God's mercy and makes us ungrateful in our forgetfulness of grace. Judas' tears of mourning took him to the grave. May our tears of mourning take our sin to the grave. To mourn means you will not glibly skip over your sin. You will not skip glibly over the damage your sin has done. We will live a blessed life when we see our sin and its effects, starting with our own and extending out to the people around us and are genuinely grieved, not because of just the damage, but because of the commission of the sin or the omission of God's command. Most of the world is able to mourn over suffering around them. Only Christians mourn over the root of suffering and sin within them. And if you're a Christian here this morning, you still ought to mourn over your sin. Because even though your sin is pardoned, your sin still rages within you. And even though you're saved from your trespasses and your sins, 
you're not cured from your sin yet. Blessed are those who mourn. And what, is it, what does it mean? Why is it a blessing to mourn? It seems antithetical to itself. It seems like it's self-contradictory. Why, why is it a blessing to mourn? Because, well, if the first beatitude has to do with spiritual bankru- bankruptcy before God, then this second blessing must refer to those who mourn over what they do possess. The first beatitude is saying, I have nothing. The second beatitude mourns what you do have. You do have something. And notice, though, the blessing of being comforted. It's in the future tense. It means it may not happen right away, but it will happen. It seems like um, Jesus is clearly referring back to Isaiah again in in chapter 61, where he says that those who are mourning will be comforted, Isaiah 61, verse 2. So he's clearly referencing Isaiah 61 again here. He's also maybe referencing the, the beginning of that second major section of Isaiah, Isaiah 40, verse 1, that says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And cry out to her that her warfare, her hardship has ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. All the sins that have been committed by the people of Israel that drilled them into exile, God's giving them back double the pardon. There's double the pardon for whatever you've sinned against God with. And you want to know what comfort means in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4? It means to come alongside. Someone will come alongside of you and walk with you through your sin and walk with you through your sorrow and walk with you through your repentance. Who? The comforter. The Holy Spirit. It's his name. In fact, actually, I would want you to take Matthew chapter 5, verse 4 as a promise, not just that you'll have comfort, but that you'll have the comforter there with you as you mourn. And when you're mourning something in life, how long do you want to be left alone mourning? Well, for a little while, maybe you want to mourn by yourself, but not forever, and not very long usually. Isn't it sweet? When you're shattered to have someone sit with you. You will. Those who mourn over their sin will know the presence of the Holy Spirit in profound ways. His presence will be with you and his presence will be enough. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. And he saves the crushed in spirit. So let me ask you some questions to close. Have you ever mourned over your sin? Maybe, there, maybe there's someone who's here who's not been coming for very long. They're newer to the church, and so they've never heard something like this before. And so this might be good for you, to, if you're newer, or maybe you haven't thought about this before, to ask yourself the question, have you ever mourned over your sin? Broken? in your heart over what you've done against God and against others? The path of blessing, the way to really live, eternal life, comes to those who mourn over their sin, recognizing, I know what I have to give to God. Number one, I have nothing. I'm poor in spirit. Number two, I have something. I have sin, so I mourn. And question number two, when you sin, is there a tendency toward godly sorrow that leads to repentance without regret? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, or 7 rather, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We should be done. I'll just walk through this just briefly with you. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10. You probably know this passage. 
But when you sin, is there a tendency in you toward godly sorrow that leads to repentance? Look at verse 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. For godly grief, there's sorrow, there's mourning, produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. Cain, Saul, Judas, verse 11. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourself. God, do whatever it takes for me to be done with this. What indignation. Like you're angry at your sin. You're not angry at the person you've sinned against. You're angry at your own sin. I, I must sound like a madman sometimes when I'm like working through something in my own life. I'm like, oh, I did that again. Oh, Lord, why am I doing that still? And like you're kind of talking to yourself. You're kind of preaching at yourself. You're kind of getting angry at yourself. Yes, that's all good. Indignation against your sin. It's part of godly mourning. What fear? God, protect me from that. I don't want to fall into that. I'm afraid of that sin. What longing? God, I want to get back to the place where I'm walking with you. What zeal? Do whatever it takes, God. What punishment? Whatever consequence I need, I'll take it. See how different that is than false mourning? That mourning is repentance. It leads to it. And then application number three to close. Do you mourn the collateral damage of sin around you such that you are driven to God in prayer for them? Do you mourn the collateral damage of sin around you such that you are driven to God in prayer for them? Seems to me like the news is just one big massive headline. Life under the curse. Exhibit A, article two, sub point three, News item four. It's just like one big long exposition of the curse. And so we want to be those who are mourning our own sin and then the effects of it all around us. And those are the people who are blessed. This is a weird spot to leave it. We're going to not go there. This is a weird spot to leave it, but I'm going to leave it there. And we'll come back to learn more about what this blessed life is. But this is how it starts with what you know you don't have and what you know you do. Father, thank you so much for these first two Beatitudes. It's, um, it is humbling, Lord. Just laid low before you. And all Jesus has done is speak two sentences. I do marvel at him, Lord. I do marvel at his authority. How could anyone do that? For people all across the world, through every age, how can there be conviction to every person in every age who sits under these first two sentences? But Lord, I thank you that we have been able to today. God, would you help us to be a people who take our sins seriously? and who love your mercy. Thank you for your son's words. What a blessing he is to us, God. Help us to begin to see what it means to live this kind of life, to really live. We ask it all in Christ's name, amen.